a sermon on, in a church on a Sunday morning ought to amount to something to justify all the time and trouble you take to get here. And therefore, I always feel a sense of great responsibility and try my best. Every Sunday, looking out from my office, I see a line of people queued up to come into this church. I see them standing there in the snow and the rain and the cold and in all kinds of weather. And that's a good thing for me because I stand there looking out at them and I always say to myself, what I'm going to say is what I'm going to say this morning worth those people standing out there. Now, I saw you, many of you standing out there today, but I'm not apologetic today because I have something to talk to you about that is terrifically important. And it is hope. I would like to think that everybody would go from this church this morning full of hope. Because as the Bible says, we are saved by hope. Now, if you always keep hope going for you, you may realize your fondest dream. If you always keep hope going for you, you may realize your most cherished goals. If you always keep hope going for you, you will be able to overcome every difficulty solve every problem, rise above every defeat, and win a just and wonderful victory in this life. Hope, it's one of the three greatest words in the Bible. And now by the faith, hope, and love these three. But the greatest of these is love. But that must mean the second greatest is either hope or faith. <laughs> well, you know, in preaching a sermon, I always fall back on good old Bartlett's quotations. I admit it. Some people quote without admitting that they found it in Bartlett. <laughs> what would we do without good old Mr. Bartlett? Well, I looked up hope. It's mentioned many times. There's a man named Robert Bridges, a poet who lived a long while ago. He says, anybody could have figured this out, hope is a better companion than fear. Certainly. <laughs> but here's a statement that's really a classic. Hope is ever livelier than despair. Isn't that a beauty? <laughs> Hope is alive. Despair is dead. Herbert Spencer, back in 1591, advised his readers to feed on hope. And then we come to Sidney Smith. He says, hope for the best and trust in God. Hope is the belief that joys will come. But he got off on another subject uh, in the same page on which I was reading. Has no relation to the subject matter of this sermon. But 
he said away back in somewhere between 1771 and 1845, which was his lifespan, he came up with the assertion that preaching has become a byword for long and dull conversation of any kind. <laughs> I really think that rules him out as an intellectual critic. <laughs> then we've got to get a quotation in here from good old Shakespeare. What a man he must have been. How, did, how was all the wisdom uh, in, that he had in one head? Must have been remarkable. He speaks about Henry IV, who lined himself with hope. Just get hope all through you. Line it. Line your brain with hope. And Matthew Arnold says, still nursing the unconquerable hope. The Alexander Pope, hope springs eternal in the human breast. God put it there because we can't live without hope. Carl Sandburg said, who can live without hope? And the Bible, finally, I don't think that amounts to anything. But no, <laughs> we are saved by hope. Now you see, if this is the case, it's all the more reason why we should be committed Christians. Because when you know Jesus Christ, you know all of these great qualities. You have faith, you have love, and you have hope. The synonym for hope could be expect. Who can live without expectation that there's something good in the future? If you had to get up in the morning and say, nothing good is ever going to happen to me, how good would your life be? When you can get up in the morning and hope that you have your skills, that you'll have your ability to succeed, that you'll have clarity of mind, then you live. In our magazine guidepost, we have a story by a famous professional basketball player named Otis Birdsong now playing with the New Jersey Nets, formerly with Kansas City Kings. He was on the championship team of the NBA, National Basketball Association. He averaged 26 points per game. One of the great players of our time. He was raised by a Christian mother, prays daily, reads the Bible every day, goes to church, is a Christian young man. But he went into a slump. Now, do you know what a slump is? <laughs> I certainly do. I've been in them myself. It's when you can't seem to do it. It's like making a speech or preaching a sermon. You can't get it over. There's no flow. There's no harmony. There's no uh, rapport. The words won't come. And if they come, the wrong ones come. <laughs> a slump. Well, a basketball player in a slump, he was skillful in making his shots whoosh through the basket, but night after night, they would go up to the basket and roll around the rim and drop on the outside on the floor. Night after night, 
he was in the slump. And the whole team got in the slump. And whereas they had won the championship the year before, now they were about 12 games behind. So he paced the floor. What should he do? And the thought came to him, talk to mom, mother. Well, he said, what she know about basketball? <laughs> she doesn't even know the terms. She doesn't even know how to score a game. Why should I talk to mom? But finally he did. He dialed the telephone. And in a glum, sad voice, he said, Hello, Mom. She said, Otis, what's the matter with you? He said, who said anything was the matter with me? She says, I am your mother. And I know when something is wrong with you. What's the trouble, son? Haven't you been praying, reading the Bible, and going to church like I brought you up to do? He says, yes, Mom, I have, but I am in a slump. She said, please tell me what is a slump. <laughs> he described a slump. Oh, she said, I've been in a lot of those myself. But, Mom, he says, you don't understand. I'm, I'm a professional champion basketball player, and I can't get the ball in the basket. And I said, in order to win, you have to get it in the basket more times than the other team gets it in the basket. Do you understand? <laughs> she said, yes, I understand. You haven't been praying as much as you should. And you haven't been reading the Bible. Oh, he said, Mom, what's that got to do with it? She says, what's that got to do with it? Everything. Now she said, son, you just go back and read the Bible and pray and believe and hope and have faith and you will get that ball in that basket. Goodbye, son. <laughs> that night, <laughs> it seems too apt, but that night he shot 35 baskets. And a whole team came out of the slump. And uh, as he went home that night, he said, mothers are funny things. They don't know nothing about anything. But they know everything about everything. If they are in the Lord. Now, Mrs. Birdsong reared a big family of 12 children. And you can't do that without character, courage, and faith, and wisdom. And the wisdom of it was, this boy was out of the flow. He was out of correlation. He was no longer in the harmony. Therefore, this elusive ball wouldn't go into that little basket. The trouble wasn't in his physical mechanism. It was in his mental apparatus. And that was out of whack. That was out of harmony. But when his mother, whom he loved, and in whom he believed more than anybody on earth, told him that he wasn't believing enough, that he wasn't praying enough, that he wasn't hoping enough. He had a complete reversal of the mental processes. 
So once again, he recaptured the old time genius, the old time flow and power. That's what the Bible may mean when it says, we are saved by hope. So if things aren't going very well with you, if you're disturbed, discouraged about them, keep that mind of yours, that sensitive instrument in harmony with the Lord Jesus, who had the greatest mind of any person who ever lived on this earth, and keep it sensitized to him, and the power will flow. You'll be saved by hope. Well, that's uh, one thing. And the other thing is that hope lifts us always out of our hopelessness. There is one of the most devastating words in the English language, hopelessness. It's, it's, it's proper that it would have less in the middle of it. Hopelessness. It goes down, you see, into complete frustration and failure. Whoever figured out the English language is a smart man because he knows how to put pictures into words. I never thought of this before. I'm just thinking of it on the spur of the moment, but it's not a bad idea. <laughs> Hopelessness doesn't lead up. Hopelessness leads down. What leads you up then? It is hope. If you're without hope, you're without life. Always believe that joys will come. Always keep expectation alive. I was in a certain city the other day when I met a friend of mine who is probably one of, if not the, most highly respected man in that city. And as always, when I stood with him, I realized I was in the presence of a miracle. He was gifted in early youth with a charming personality. He was hired by a bank to do a routine job, but his personality made itself felt so that they assigned him the job of entertaining prominent customers of the bank, especially from out of town. And they gave him a membership in the leading club of the city. And he got the notion that the way to entertain customers was to uh, encourage them to drink plenty of alcohol. So he would have luncheons, and the alcohol flowed, the whiskey flowed, the brandy flowed, the vodka flowed, everything flowed. And of course, he felt that where anybody else had a drink, he should have a drink. And it got so that he'd go back to the bank in the afternoon completely intoxicated, reeling and inebriated, and they'd send him home. Got so that he would show up at the bank at nine o'clock in the morning, drunk. And he got so bad that they couldn't use him anymore to entertain customers. And he got so bad that after a while he couldn't use him, period. By this time, he'd become one of the vice presidents of the bank. So the banker called him in and he said, I'm sorry, Bill, which isn't his name, Bill, I've got to let you go. Sorry about it. And he said, furthermore, you are such a despicable character that I'm going to see to it that no bank in this state hires you. You'll never get a job. And the boy knew it because this man was the dean of all the bankers in the state. 
So after a while, his wife got fed up with him. She left him. He had two children. They'd have nothing to do with him. He lost his beautiful home in the country club district. He was thrown out of the membership of the other downtown club. He was thrown out of the country club where he played golf. Finally, his money went. And his friends ignored him. And it got so that he panhandled on the street of the very city in which he'd been a top vice president of the biggest bank in the state. What you might call in the old terminology a bum. Then he got himself committed to an institution for alcoholics under the state because he had no money to go elsewhere. And there was an atheist there. And the atheist said, uh, Mr. So-and-so, I understand that you were chairman of the board of elders and deacons of the First Presbyterian Church. Yeah, he said, I was. They threw me out. Well, he said, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. You believe in God. We both landed in the same place. So your God must not amount to very much. This was the thing that first got to my friend. Finally, he left this place. And he went back home to his mother. Strange, isn't it, how you run to mama? <laughs> That's built into us. Run to mama. So mama said, son, there's only one way for you to recoup. And that is to really get converted to Jesus Christ because you have been a spiritual failure. And I'm honored to say that she made him read a couple of my books. And one day, under a tree on that farm of his mother's, he committed himself to Jesus Christ. And it took instantly. He no longer had the alcohol problem. Went back, gradually worked up into the bank across the street. Then one day I heard he had cancer. And I called him on the phone and I said, don't let us throw you, old boy. I was afraid he'd go back to the other. He said, don't you worry. Jesus, who freed me from the other, will take care of me in this. He later became head of the cancer society of his state. He's still healthy after these many years. And not long ago, they put up in his city an eternal flame in the central plaza. And they dedicated it to him. And I asked him, did you ever lose heart? No, he said. Because when I read the Bible one day, I read where it said, we are saved by hope. So I've hung on to hope. And that has pulled me through until this day. I stood and looked at him. He's got gray hair now. Fine looking, almost venerable man a testimony to the incredible power of the Lord Jesus Christ in whom we have hope to save us. Our Heavenly Father, we conceive of this as being of the gospel and we preach this sermon because we believe in what we've said that if there's anyone here present amongst these fine people in whom hope is low or the flame going out 
revive it again by your loving grace and your wondrous power.